today we're going to go over Carry On Mr. Bowditch, chapters 6 through 9. First we're going to go over Nat as our protagonist once again. Um, and one, he is continuing to just develop, um, even admit some, some circumstances which are not so good for developing. Um, so he's not going to run away from um, his indentured servanthood. Um, he instead says, you know, to Liza, I'm going to learn a trade. I'm going to, you know, be the best at, that I can in this circumstance. Um, he's motivated. Anytime he is not working, and when he does work, it's working hard, he is learning. He's constantly learning. And um, I would put him as a self-educator. So even though he's not in school with somebody teaching him, he is going to take every bit of material he can get his hands on and he's going to write it down. He's going to memorize it. He's going to think hard about it. And sometimes that's the best type of education um, far above, you know, somebody telling you what you need to know. Um, if you are motivated, you can you can really learn a lot like that. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting is you will find that everybody likes Nat. Remember, he's young, about 12 years old, and um, it is just exciting to talk to a young man like Nat that is so motivated, and um, it's just a breath of fresh air, and, and I think that um, he is just doing a great job of being that in that community. Um, he also doesn't give up on his hopes very easily. The back of his mind is still that Harvard idea, and that's that's great, you know. So he continues to make the little preparations he can, even though it's probably not a big possibility. Then one more thing I'll talk about with his personality is um, he's very family oriented and, you know, he didn't, that was the hard thing about going to do this job was leaving his family, especially his siblings. And, um, when his family wants to talk, when his siblings want to talk about something, they come to Nat. And so you saw when Liza came to Nat and said, you know, you need to talk about to, to Mary. And he, um, you know, didn't shy away from that. Ah, that's none of my business. He went, okay. And he went, and then I really liked the way he used wit to convince Mary that she loves this man, and, um, you know, that <laughs> the, the solution isn't just, you know, oh, I'm scared of this situation of marrying a sailor, so I should just run, but instead to realize that's what it is, but that seems to be where she was called and who she was called to marry, and I thought he did a really good job handling that in a positive way. Um... We're also introduced to Ben Meeker, kind of the, one of the first people we meet in the Chandlery. This is another foil character, and he um, was very much had the same set of circumstances as Nat, and that's kind of what a foil character is, and so we get to see another reaction to kind of compare and contrast it with Nat. So he says he is becalmed, okay, and... Um, once again, we've got sort of going back to ship analogies and, and um, you know, symbolism and things. And so when the wind dies down on a ship, it becalms the ship. It means the ship's not going to go very far, um, if at all. And so then you must sail by ash breeze. And that means you get out those wooden ash oars and you, you know, just put your oar in the water over and over and over. And it's, it's a... Uh, you know, keeping going when there's really nothing to, you know, when you just have to do your own get up and go, as the, the book describes it. Anyway, so Ben Meeker um, was also indentured as a young man, and now he is old, and he says, I'm just completely becalmed, you know, couldn't keep up that sailing by ash breeze, and that's what's going to happen to you, Nat, is basically what he says. Um... And immediately, Sam Smith, another old sailor, steps in and says, Ben, I don't even want you around Nat, and protects Nat from that influence. And you need to realize, as a young man, what kind of older influences are around you? Because the Ben Meekers, um, you know, 
are not the kind of voices. You want the encouraging voices, the ones that say press on in the Lord and things like that, not just, oh, you're going to end up, you know, um, we need to keep our hope. Okay. And um, so then you have the example of Sam Smith, who, who just, you know, takes him around, takes him under his wing, you know, shows that even amidst bad circumstances, you can still have pleasant relationships and, and be giving. Um, we're, we're also going to just mention that the father um, continues to deteriorate. And, you know, the title of the book is Carry On, Mr. Bowditch. And um, father is not carrying on at all anymore, and his own children aren't even really wanting to talk about it. But uh, we'll also mention they're respectful. You know, they don't go on and on, you know, gossiping. They just, well... He's not doing well, and they could, you know, they carry on. They don't dwell on the bad. Okay, I want to talk about some literary techniques we saw. First is situational irony. Okay, so Nat was hoping that his expectation he bought would would amass him a huge fortune, and it did in a way that we don't typically think of. It was in the form of books. Remember the whole situation with the books and they were at the pharmacy and anyway they ended up putting these books that came from the ship in a library and Nat gets access to them because everybody knows he is just a great you know scholar. Okay so he did get his expectations in the end in a way he didn't expect in that situational irony. Okay then we've got some symbolism. Um, once again, when he didn't collect his expectation, remember they tore up that expectation note and they scattered it on the water and squinted and thought of it as flowers, you know, for the man that died. And um, then once again, when Lizza dies, he tears up the note he had written to her and uh, scatters it on the water. And it symbolizes both deaths, but more than that, most it symbolizes lost hopes. Or in, in this book, back to that they like to use the analogy of um, sea, sea stuff. It's lost anchors, okay? So he just lost Liza, his anchor, all right? So um, then we've got a brother-in-law coming to try to kind of cheer Nat up and um, ends up, Nat stays up all night studying his Latin. And everybody kind of, well, the brother-in-law and that, you know, studying is his anchor to windward now that he's lost. Lizza, one of his other anchors. And we can contrast that, you know, more characterization to the father where his anchor, when he lost everything, tended to be sinful activities. Okay? Nat turns to a good thing, studying, just keep carrying on. Okay? Then in the morning we have um, Elizabeth which is symbolic, a little Liza, you know, a fresh kind of person, bringing him a book in Latin. And I think that's going to be what we would call foreshadowing. She's going to be a new anchor in his life, the new Liza, the new, you know, and so it makes me think of that verse, you know, the Lord's mercies are new every morning. In the morning, there was a new anchor provided, okay? So, themes. Sailing by ash breeze. So that is when you're, you know, getting ahead by your own get up and get up, get up and go. You know, you everything's kind of against you or not helping you and you keep going. And which leads right into perseverance. Even if you have to do it for years, keep going, okay? We also have a themes of reaction to disappointment, okay? A lot of disappointment in these chapters. And Nat's reaction is to keep going going, keep knowing what he, doing what he knows to do is right and good and best, okay? Now, the other thing that's not connected with those things is there was a small segment on where Nat is going around doing his chandlery work, and everywhere he goes, they say, well, the most important thing on a ship is ropes. Well, the most important thing on a ship is the sail. Well, you get the picture, okay? Now, this is a, this is a theme here that's not, you know, mentioned over and over, but worth, worth exploring. Um, the, the, do you see how that for a ship to work, each individual person and each individual um, part 
is important, you know, and we can think of the scriptures of the body of Christ, the church. We need each individual member and person doing their, their part, and all things in life are, are kind of like that, and all oops, subjects of learning are kind of like that, too, so um, that's another theme to think about. And things to talk about, especially with your parents um, this time, is handling deep grief. Um, a lot of death in, in this section. And um, that's a common theme to put in books because it's not something that a lot of us experience. Uh, well, I mean, in fact, I have not had a lot of personal death in my life, and I am much, much older than you guys. And a book is a good way to kind of just to maybe prepare <laughs> or think about. So I want you to talk about how do you handle a really deep grief? How do you help others to handle a really deep grief? What did you see happening in the story? Do you agree or disagree? Okay. The last thing is just the importance of family relationships, and especially they showing sibling relationships in this book. You know, there is... A special thing about a sibling, they're the only people that understand what it's like to live with your parents and to have grown up in your house. And um, that relationship will be special your whole life long. And um, I really think Nat's siblings are all doing a good job of using that camaraderie and love and things to, to really encourage one another. Okay. For our thinking activity, I want you to make a chart, and um, you can see here, consuming, producing, and learning to produce, okay? I really like Nat's, that he is just constantly producing or learning to produce. When he's working at his chandlery, he works hard. When he's not, he is learning the academic skills to make himself more productive when his nine years are over. You don't see him doing much of consuming. Now, consuming is not, I don't want to paint that as you should never do that. But I want you to actually look through scripture and talk about um, what what does the Bible say most of our time should be spent on. I could even, let's, let's just go back to the beginning, right? God is a creator God. First thing he did was create. We could you, you know, substitute the word produce there. And then he said he created, he produced us in his own image, meaning with some like characteristics and among other things. So we are created to produce. We are created to, to make beauty. We are created to cultivate the earth, like he told Adam. All these sort of things. And um, your generation in particular is known for consuming. That means things like... Um, entertaining yourselves, things like eating, things like um, watching TV and video games and um, just playing games or, you know, whatever. And um, anyway, so make a chart. See where, what, what are you spending your time on? Think and pray about that. Talk to your parents about that and make sure you're in line with God's will on the direction. You know, you were made for a purpose, and, um, you know, how can we glorify God with the use of our time? That's all.